Uh, I'd like to start off with a couple of thank yous in this week of very significant international meetings, it seems. Uh, first to you and colleagues who actually had the idea and started up uh, the process for this meeting, uh, which is proving to be already extremely interesting, uh, and also for inviting me. That's, that's uh, a great pleasure. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I shall start off talking about wheat prin principally, and just very, very simply, uh, thinking about how wheat has been so successful evolutionarily. Of course, like all other plants and animals, mutation is the ultimate source of generation of new diversity. But the great thing about wheat is that it is able to self, so it has a very high potential for a rapid and exact multiplication of fit genotypes and phenotypes. However, outcrossing does occur, which is although very, at a very low rate, is extremely important in the evolution of the crop. Uh, of course, it's not important if you have a very large monoculture crop because any outcrossing that does occur is from the same pollen anyway. But if there is any kind of diversity in an area, then outcrossing, even at 2%, is going to be important evolutionarily. And polyploidy, we've already heard uh, something about that uh, this morning. So, putting all of those together, wheat has been very successful. But I think a thing that's forgotten is that in order that certain pathogens, pests, and even weeds have managed to continue to deal with the wheat crop, they have had, simultaneously, they've had to evolve in ways which are sufficiently complex to allow them to deal with that complex challenge. Now, I'll come back to that in a bit more detail in a moment, but uh, the important thing historically, I think, was in the middle of the 19th century, it became a kind of turning point for agriculture, where on the one hand, Darwin and other colleagues, uh, but Darwin had published his book on natural selection and evolution, showing the basic, fundamental, huge importance of diversity. On the other hand, the Industrial Revolution, uh, which was happening uh, particularly in, in Europe at the time, or that Industrial Revolution, included the industrialization of agriculture, which means, in a sense, industrialization usually means a kind of streamlining, which in turn means loss of diversity. And it also means centralization. And that centralization occurred or started to develop both in food and in energy production with, of course, the discovery of all the huge oil fields in uh, the states and so on. So agriculture, in a sense, I think, took the wrong turning uh, at that point. And the sorts of things that developed were the kinds of problems that I was then uh, faced with, although they were well established by then, the so-called boom and bust cycle, where a breeder introduces a new resistant variety. As soon as it's grown on any kind of scale at all, it acts as uh, an enormous selection tool on the pathogen population, and uh, very quickly the variety is overcome, so new ones have to be introduced a continuous cyclical problem for breeders, the boom and bust. One particular example, and I want to link this back to my first uh, comment, is with yellow stripe rust, uh, which many of you will be familiar with. And recent research, which has shown two major changes in the stripe rust pathogen population. The first, which was very alarming in itself, was that the pathogen is now able to thrive under much warmer conditions than it previously was worldwide. When I started, uh, you know, even in the space of my career, when I started, yellow rust was always known as a disease of cool climates. 
but now it can grow on a much wider area. And the second thing that's been discovered by including some of the same people, Moran's Homuller and others, widespread new races on new monocultures have been emerging apparently from the Himalayan region and spreading. Now, to be able to spread, uh, well, to be able to produce those uh, changes, those adaptations, and then spread, this goes back to my first comment, that if wheat evolved in such a way that the pathogens had to evolve in a similar, very complex way, and you then start to grow wheat in a very simple way on a very large area, then the pathogen clearly is going to have an absolute field day. It's wonderful. No problems. And this is what's happening on an enormous scale. And I think in that sense, uh, we have to think very much more carefully about our approach to dealing with these pathogens, pests and weeds, and clearly diversity is one of them. Uh, I started off um, uh, with a, a very fortunate uh, working relationship with a man called John Barrett in the genetics department in Cambridge. And when we'd learned to understand each other, um, we thought that, well, perhaps variety mixtures might be a way of introducing some diversity into a crop so that the, pop the uh, problems of the uh, pathogen populations were made more complex. Uh, and indeed, even very simple mixtures do work remarkably well. Uh, but although the whole process took off exponentially in the 70s in the UK, which was very exciting, uh, particularly for a young scientist at that stage, uh, we hit the quality ceiling. Uh, the industrial users of wheat and barley were just not very keen on losing control of what they saw as their industrial feedstocks. And so variety mixtures, they started off well, but they didn't persist. And of course, if nobody was buying the grain from uh, a farmer's variety mixture, then he's not going to grow it again. Even though in our mixture trials, we found uh, really very good results in terms of yield. Uh, this is just a very uh, a small handful, really. There are lots of others in the literature. But most, in most mixture comparisons, where there's disease, where there's uh, diversity of resistance, then the mixture tends to out-yield uh, all the components, or most of them. But it failed. However, it was picked up, there's a lovely story here which I'd like to go in, into in more detail, but I just don't have time. Uh, the East Germans picked it up from us uh, and the Danes, and during the 1980s, they established variety mixtures in the former German Democratic Republic, uh, really fired by the fact that if they didn't, then they had to buy West German fungicides uh, which were very expensive. Uh, the uh, differential between the East and West German Deutschmark was, of course, huge. So that was uh, extremely interesting from a practical point of view. And the whole of the East German spring barley crop was turned over to these variety mixtures during the 1980s. But of course, that graph that I've shown has a sharp cutoff because in November uh, 1989 the Berlin Wall came down, Germany was reunified and the acreage of mixtures or the hectareage of mixtures went from 350,000 to 20,000 in a year. Ah, so what do we do? Uh, these mixtures they were having problems, uh, but also it seemed to me that in fact it was just not possible to build enough diversity into those mixtures to deal with what was happening and what was going to happen. That is dealing with organic and low input conditions 
and for climate change. We need much more diversity, both within crop and among crops. So this got me really interested in the notion of land races, genetically heterogeneous populations associated with particular areas, and just for the moment, at least, I'll call these or refer to these as basic land races, as opposed to what we've been doing more recently uh, of actually through evolutionary breeding, uh, breeding land races, so let's call them the composite cross populations, let's call them bred land races, at least for the moment. Uh, so, what this is really saying, and I think this is the, one of the key factors about using land races, which we don't hear so much of, that by reintroducing or establishing or concentrating on all of that uh, diversity that is in those crops, we're actually reinstating or confirming the major uh, kinds of uh, ways in which we can deal with the pests and pathogens because life becomes much more complicated again than it does if we're growing just monocultures. Uh, this was the particular uh, population approach, composite cross population approach that uh, we took uh, with uh, the Organic Research Center going back to the beginning of the century actually and the set of varieties that you see there was what we would regard as a modern set at that time and it's divided into two groups uh, the blue ones uh, at the top there are the high yielding or high yielding reputation varieties the ones below are ones with high quality so by doing a half dial cross with those 21 parents, that allowed us to produce three populations, which I've labeled uh, the YQ, the Y, and the Q. So the YQ is simply yield and quality, so all varieties intercross with each other. The Y is the yield set, which only uh, incorporates the yield varieties, and the Q, the quality. So how do they perform in practice? Well, uh, Bruce is going to be talking in a bit more detail about that shortly, so I'll just uh, illustrate it with one diagram and a couple of pictures. Uh, what we found over a lot of trials is that if you look at this graph, what the horizontal axis is uh, pointing out is as you go from naught to 40 in this case, that's an increase in yield variability. In other words, we're going from nice, uniform, pleasant, gentle conditions on the left to a real horror story for growing wheat on the right. Now, as you do that, on the vertical axis, we can then compare the performance of uh, the population against the parents uh, as uh, conditions deteriorate, let's say. And you can see there's a very clear positive relationship. Uh, as I've often said to people, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Uh, and to show that in practice, this was a the result of a, a very simple trial last year where this is winter wheat sown in autumn 2016 under appalling conditions. Uh, it was very late. It was late because of uh, some administrative problems um, and we got into a really bad spell of weather and in fact uh, most of the plots were virtually drilled into frozen soil. The end result you can see in 2017 this is one alley, uh, this is an agroforestry alley of the crop and you can see the population growing in the foreground. It's not a very big crop but at least it is producing uh, a useful harvestable crop. Behind that you can see a big patch of weeds 
And the big patch of weeds was actually where we grew three different control modern monoculture varieties. They couldn't hack it, they failed. So uh, there are a number of pictures of this sort of uh, experiment or trial observation, uh, not only for us in the UK, but these populations have been used in Germany, Hungary, uh, a number of European countries generally, uh, but the Germans and the Hungarians particularly have similar pictures, similar observations of uh, modern varieties having real problems with uh, serious winter conditions and uh, the population surviving. Uh, just coming up to date a bit now, these are pictures, a couple of pictures from last week actually. Uh, we now have a spring YQ population and the nice thing about developing a spring population in addition to the winter is the way that one can do it, which is simply to grow the winter population as a spring crop. It's a terrible mess at the beginning, lots of plants don't flower as you'd expect, uh, but just stick at it, uh, it's not difficult to do at all, and eventually out comes a spring population. It's taken a number of years, but last year this spring population out yielded, uh, again actually under rather poor conditions, I have to admit, but it did out yield uh, a modern spring wheat uh, number one control variety. That same variety is in this trial as well, and I suspect the modern variety is going to win this season uh, because the crop went in in uh, reasonably good conditions. But the whole point is, as uh, all of us concerned with land races well know, land races, populations uh, are able to tolerate much worse conditions and survive uh, compared with single monocultures. Uh, this is a population that we, or I've just decided that I think we ought to try and get it certified and released. This is the Q version and uh, this uh, we think should have better quality in fact than the YQ uh, because most of the uh, varieties that we're using had very different forms of good quality which should now be included within the population. Uh, this trial, which looks rather like the others, uh, is uh, I think potentially a rather interesting one towards not a basic land race or a bred land race, but what one might call uh, a universal land race. And what it is uh, is that I've taken our YQ population, uh, put it into trial, in fact I started this last year, against uh, a mixture which is almost certainly a population put together by John Letts in England. I think he's lost count of how many old land race varieties went into it, but it may be uh, more than a hundred. But the point about it is that his uh, land race population is a population of old varieties. Uh, I think nearly, well most of them certainly, but perhaps nearly all of them, pre-war and going back quite some time. Whereas uh, our YQ population is effectively a, a modern population. Now my feeling is that we can argue about modern varieties and old varieties and which are best and so on and so forth, but I think they all potentially have something useful to literally, almost literally, bring to the table. Uh, so why not put them together? So my intention this autumn is to actually make uh, a grand mixture of uh, the old uh, population um, that uh, John produced with our YQ and we'll grow it and look at it and select it uh, from now on. 
However, that's a rather crude and simple way of uh, perhaps improving or giving us more diversity in land races to work with. There's also magic that we can use. There's uh, magic actually stands for this multi-parent advanced generation intercross system. Uh, this is a number of institutions and breeders have now actually already produced these uh, sorts of populations in a wide range of crops, not just uh, wheat and cereals, with the idea of being able to use these intercrosses as a way of refining genetic analysis of what's going on in populations. And there hasn't been much consideration given, as I understand it at any rate, to the possibility of actually using them in practice. But I think there might be a whole wealth of information there that we should really think about for modern land races. So, just summarizing uh, that part, uh, comparing the conventional monoculture and the composite cross population, uh, high yield or moderate yield, but in order to get that high yield with a, a modern monoculture, you have to invest large amounts of money. And the, the line, the bottom line, uh, after doing all of that, without going through that table in detail, is that I think actually composite cross populations or the modern or universal bred land races are a better bet. Uh, but we have some problems still. How are we going to fund uh, this research and reward the delivery of such land races? Um, we are making some progress with some of the problems. We do have a temporary marketing experiment for general use in the EU at the moment, and I'm hoping it can be extended at least. Uh, but I think a great advantage of a meeting like this, of people coming together looking at the advantages of land races, is that it should help to make our case much stronger uh, for the EU when it comes to making a decision about whether to continue with them or not in conventional agriculture. At least in uh, organic agriculture, uh, there was uh, a vote just a couple of weeks ago to accept the new organic uh, regulation for the EU, which I think will be fully introduced by 2021. And that makes provision for something called heterogeneous materials, a wonderful term, uh, but it does, uh, as far as we can understand, and uh, it actually originates from the ideas of using composite cross populations uh, and encourages their further use. The next problem, of course, is who's going to buy this stuff? Who's going to use it? And here you will have uh, a very nice presentation tomorrow, I'm sure, from Kimberly Bell, uh, who we were introduced to through uh, a company called Hovmadods, and she is a wonderful artisanal baker, very skilled, very energetic, and very enthusiastic about the idea of land races and uh, these populations. She has developed her skills into as you briefly see in this panel of pictures, making wonderful sourdough bread out of wholemeal population flour, stone ground. Uh, so, what she is now being able to do through uh, ourselves, Hobbardods and so on, is the idea of actually decentralizing food production in this case, uh, in the sense that uh, we've now identified uh, a farmer close to where she's based, near Nottingham in the middle of England, a very good organic farmer who will be producing the grain for uh, that little centre. He will sell his grain on to uh, a windmill, again quite close to uh, Nottingham. So this organically produced uh, stone ground flour will then go to Kimberley uh, for producing 
not only uh, wonderful sourdough bread, but uh, pastry as well, which is perhaps even better than the bread. So we then have a very localized system where lots of local people can understand and visit and uh, get familiar with this whole process. Uh, and let's hope we can repeat it in different parts of the country. But now I'm just finally going to go and uh, push the boat out uh, even further uh, with this rather startling bit of data which I was able to put together uh, a couple of years ago uh, from some American publications that if we go back 10,000 years uh, in the world's history, the planet's history, we can calculate very approximately of course that there were roughly one and a half million trees per human being on the planet. That huge number of trees just in 10,000 years has been halved and of course the human population has gone up like a skyrocket. So now the figure has gone down to 400 trees per human being and I find that one of the most frightening bits of uh, statistics I've come across. So from one and a half million to 400 trees per human. So, most of the trees that we actually use, uh, if we think about it and look at it, are land races. So, can't we bring all this together? I think we should integrate crop land races, tree land races, livestock land races into appropriate agroforestry systems so that the complex diversity which we build up, so it's not thinking about not just diversity in one crop like wheat, but thinking about diversity in everything in the system can help to really support and develop resilience overall, the whole system. So it's partly by the, or one of the things that it does in order to work in this way is of course to increase the overall biodiversity uh, in the farming systems, uh, which might be termed land sharing in, among those people who argue about land sharing and land sparing. Uh, and I think land sparing is a way of preserving biodiversity is an absolutely lunatic notion. Uh, so, what have we got? Um, alley cropping is what uh, we like to do at Wakelands. And here you can see uh, spring wheat and barley. Uh, some of those are populations. Uh, it's an early stage in the spring uh, last year. Intercropped with mixed willow hedges. Now these willow hedges uh, have a about five different components, so they're a mixture, and we, we grow those for fuel production along with hazel uh, willow hedges, and the hazel is an outcrossing population anyway. Uh, and they, uh, we coppice the willow and the hazel and then dry the sticks and chip them, and that provides all the central heating and hot water for the house. Uh, and, of course, the understory we leave, which becomes highly biodiverse. Uh, here's another example of some of the sorts of things we're trying at the moment uh, in the timber alley cropping uh, alleys. In this case, uh, we're looking at a crop of lentils and camelina uh, intercropped together and in among the trees there are apple trees for example which uh, I can faithfully report have much less in the way of pests and diseases than apples grown in an orchard layout. Uh, we're going to be able to I hope very soon take this energy aspect one important step further in that uh, a colleague I'm working with in Wales is developing a small-scale combined heat and power unit. You can buy large-scale combined 
heat and power units for hundreds of thousands of euros, but you can't buy small ones. Uh, the one that they're producing, I hope we'll have on the farm very shortly, and the idea is that that will replace our current uh, wood chip boiler. But inside the combined heat and power unit, there's actually a small steam turbine, so it generates electricity as well. So I want to be able to drive around in an electric van which has painted on the side this van runs on wood chips. Uh, so in this kind of way we can really decentralize or help to decentralize energy production because of course when you think about large-scale national systems there are enormous losses due to transmission of energy uh, from the site of production to the site of use. So, I think, and just as my final summary, or not quite final, but more, more or less final summary up slide, uh, this is a space picture of Wakelands, uh, but I think that agroforestry, if we think about it in a, a really good general way, as I've tried to suggest uh, this afternoon, can decentralize or help to decentralize food production and decentralize energy production. But the great thing is that by using these ag sort of agroforestry systems, those two processes actually integrate and help each other. And that can lead to decentralized uh, biodiversity and indeed even decentralized economics. So, ladies and gentlemen, there it is, uh, a population growing in a mixed tree alley. Thank you.